There's a new software synthesizer in town, and it does something that no other software synthesizer has ever done before. So let's check it out. But first of all, hello everybody. In case you're new here, my name is Michael Wagner. I'm a digital media educator with more than 30 years of experience in higher education. And on this channel, I talk about digital media, game design, and spatial audio. If any of those topics interest you, I invite you to subscribe or join my Discord community. Invite link is in the description below, or there's also a QR code here somewhere. The software synthesizer I'm talking about is called Skydust 3D. It's from Sound Particles. And the one thing it does differently to other software synthesizers is that it treats oscillators as objects in three-dimensional space. So instead of using oscillators in a traditional sense, what you're actually doing is you're mixing uh, three-dimensional sound sources and constructing your soundscapes uh, that way. Now, before I continue, there are a couple of things I need to clarify. First of all, this video is going to be released only a couple of hours after Skydust 3D is going to be released. During the filming of this video, I had access to the beta version, the pre-release version of Skydust 3D, and that essentially means that if you purchase it, there are certain things that might look differently. Uh, in particular, at least as far as I'm aware, at the moment I'm filming this video, they are still curating the number of presets that they're, that they're going to ship with uh, Skydust 3D. So if there are certain presets that you see on my screen that don't show up in the uh, release version, uh, don't worry about that. That's just because I had access to the beta version. The second thing is that even though I was in contact with Sound Particles and they provided me with a beta or pre-release version of their software instrument, this is not a sponsored video. So they don't have any say in what I'm going to talk about today. Everything that I'm going to say is completely my own opinion and they also didn't see this video before it actually went live. The third thing is that this instrument comes in two versions, a stereo version and a 3D version. Now the 3D version can produce sound in higher channel counts and it can also produce sound in ambisonics directly. In my understanding, this is actually the first synthesizer that can produce ambisonics audio directly. So in that sense, it is actually really, really unique. Now the version that I'm going to use here is the 3D version, uh, which essentially means that if you're purchasing the stereo version, there are certain options that you're not going to have, in particular options that are related to the output configuration of the software synthesizer. And finally, this is actually a fairly complex synthesizer that would require more than just one video. So what I'm going to do in this particular video, I'm first going to show you the basic functionality of the synthesizer and I'm going to do that in an Ableton session. Ableton, because why not? And then I'm going to, in the second part of this video, going to show you how to set it up in a multi-channel setup in Cubase. Um, Noendo would work the same way. Now, if you're only interested in the multi-channel setup, I'm going to leave a timestamp uh, in the description below so that they can jump uh, to that portion of the video directly. And I might actually do some additional videos in the future where I go into some details because I will not be able to cover everything. And with that being said, let's get right into playing around with Skydust. So here we have the main interface of Skydust. And as I said before, I'm going to start out in Ableton and I'm going to work on a Mac today, but it works on Windows as well. And it doesn't really matter which digital audio workstation you're using. Uh, it can be a stereo digital audio workstation just like Ableton, or it can be a multi-channel digital audio workstation. Now there's certain features that it can only use in the multi-channel DAW obviously, but uh, it is um, essentially usable in any digital audio workstation out there. Now the main interface is divided into a couple of different sections. On the left here, we have the uh, presets that are shipped with uh, Skydust. Now, as I said before, I'm working with the pre-release version. So in the final version, these presets might look different. The at the moment still curating some of these presets. So some of the things that you see here might not show up in the release version and there might be others that I don't have here. So don't worry about that. On the right side, we have a... Uh, and, and, and kind of a graph that shows us the three-dimensional position of the individual oscillators or the individual sound objects. And the way this works is uh, the same way it works with any sound particles uh, plugin. And that is that this is really meant to be viewed as more like a sphere. So if I'm positioning a sound in the middle of that graph, that doesn't mean that that sound is located at the listener position. It means that that sound is located above the middle, uh, the listener. So it's essentially kind of, think of it like a, like almost like a sphere. Uh, on the bottom here, we have uh, a couple of different things that we can uh, that we can select. We can select, for example, a piano roll. So we can kind of select uh, sort of the keys here. We have a mixer section that will allow us to mix the individual oscillators. We're going to talk about those in a second. We do have a section for macros. So if you want to create some macros, you can do that. There are a couple of pads uh, in case you want to control it with, uh, for example, a MIDI uh, device that allow you, allows you to kind of uh, control your sound 
want to in, in a pet kind of way, you can do that. And then the final one here is uh, the spatial information that gives us some information about where the sounds are located. And uh, in order to really see what or how that works, let me just play a simple sound here. I've selected the um, initial preset that it kind of comes up with, at least kind of the version that I have. And so if I play here, I will essentially see uh, a couple of different sounds that are uh, located in our three-dimensional space. Uh, so essentially we see here two sound objects that are stable and these sound objects are slightly above me. So once again, think of this as something that is a little bit more like a sphere. And then we have two sound objects that are oscillating here, uh, the blue one and the red one. And these four sound objects are really four oscillators that are modified in certain ways. Now, in order to kind of get into the details, there are a couple of things that we can do that we can select here on the top section. So there is sort of the main interface that, that we, we just went through. There is a, a kind of a page that allows us to select all the different oscillators. Now we have eight different oscillators. And once again, I'm going to come back to them in a second. There is a filter section. The filter section allows us to add filters um, to individual oscillators or also to uh, global uh, globally to the entire sound. So we, we can do both. Um, and uh, these filters essentially can be uh, controlled through a, uh, an envelope uh, generator. So for example, we can select uh, the filter to have a certain attack time and decay time, sustain time. And all the envelope generators that we have in Skydust uh, are flexible in the sense that we can either do a uh, standard ADSR uh, envelope generator or we can go up to, for example, a uh, delay, attack, hold, decay, sustain, release. Uh, envelope generator. So those are all kinds of options. So let me just turn those off again. And then all the oscillators also, all the filter sections also have an LFO section. So we can also control them through an LFO. And uh, this can be, for example, uh, a sine function, squares, triangles, and all kinds of things. So there, there are many different options that you have here. And uh, we can then essentially kind of change the, uh, the frequency or kind of the shape with which this is oscillating. There's also the possibility to modify it. So whenever we come across a, an LFO, there's also the possibility to modify those. So for example, we can do a wave folding here, and then we can select how much wave folding we want to have. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of what these LFOs are. So for most of the sections that we're going to talk about, we will always have some sort of an envelope generator that we can use and uh, some sort of an LFO that we can use. And um, that is actually kind of really gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of possibilities to fine tune the sounds that we want to have. Now, this, the third uh, kind of page here, and let me just turn it off maybe. And the third, the third page here is the frequency modulation page, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. But in essence, you can think of this uh, synth as, some, as something that has eight oscillators, and these oscillators can used be either as objects in three-dimensional space, or they can be used in order to modulate uh, other os oscillators. And um, I'm going to show you how that goes in, in a second. Then we have a, a pitch section. Uh, this allows us to control the pitch uh, in exactly the same way we had the filter section. We also are able to use use an envelope generator or a low frequency, uh, an LFO. Uh, so, so there are kind of all things that we can do here. Um, there is uh, a spatial section and this is actually the unique thing because this now allows us to to uh, change the position of the objects or the oscillators in three-dimensional space in exactly the same way we would use, uh, we would change the uh, the filter or the pitch. So it also kind of, we can do that with uh, an envelope generator or an LFO. And how that works, I'm going to come back in a second as well. Then we have an up section. The up section, we have an abridge, a, a, a Apeggiator, uh, and this Apeggiator has a couple of different presets that we can use. So for example, we have the up-down notes, so if I'm playing the, down, uh, the, the note now. So uh, very basic stuff. And then we have also a sequencer section and the sequencer section. And one thing that's really nice is that they kind of selected this, uh, or kind of chose to uh, visualize the sequencer with a piano roll. That, that's actually something that is fairly new. 
or kind of very unusual. Let, let's let's call it that way. And this uh, essentially can be either a mono keyboard or we can also do, have a poly keyboard, meaning that we can have, for example, uh, essentially multiple keys playing simultaneously. And uh, in addition to uh, the, indiv the individual keys that are played, we can also add parameters for the um, sequencer. So, for example, if we want to have certain parameters sequenced, we can we can add them here and uh, and essentially kind of control them that way as well. So, let me just turn that maybe off again. And then we have very very standard thing and uh, an effects section. Um, basic stuff that you have on any uh, software instrument these days. We have a delay, a reverb, and there are a couple of other things that we have, a bit crusher, an equalizer, distortion module, and so forth. Um, then we have uh, a page that covers extras, and extras essentially means that we can add additional envelope generators or additional uh, low-frequency oscillators, and we can map them to certain parameters. Um, and then finally, we also have a matrix here, and this matrix then allows us to really kind of uh, connect the things accordingly. And here is, for example, where we would also kind of generate our macros. So if we want to set certain macros, that can be then accessible through the macro uh, kind of uh, selection here, uh, we would essentially add the, uh, the individual kind of um, matrix destinations to the macros here in this particular uh, page. So these are essentially the basic pages of the uh, SkyDust instrument. So let's have a look on how these uh, individual pages function. And once again, uh, one of the key ideas of this uh, synthesizer is that you have eight oscillators. And these eight oscillators can function either as sound objects in three-dimensional space, or they can be used as oscillators that modulate other oscillators. So, so that gives you essentially a lot of flexibility. Now, uh, the best way to kind of uh, see how that is uh, working in action is maybe by just looking at the at one of the presets. So let's do that. So let's go back to the main page and let's make sure that we have the ethereal keys preset selected because that I think is actually a really good one to demonstrate how SkyDust works. Now ethereal keys, uh, once again, we have four objects, two are stationary, two are moving. Those uh, four objects are implemented with the use of all eight oscillators. So as we see, all eight oscillators are active. And uh, if we go into the mixer section here, we actually see that only four of those producing sound. And this is because the remaining four oscillators are used in order to modulate oscillators that are used as sound objects. Now, how this is done, we can actually see by going into the frequency modulating section. So here we see that uh, oscillator... Five, four and five are used in order to modulate oscillator three and oscillator seven and eight are used in order to modulate oscillator six. And that essentially means if we once again play the sound, we only get sound out of uh, one, two, three and six and uh, four, five, seven, eight are essentially just used for modulating oscillators three and six. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to solo one of the oscillators or one of the sound objects in order to give you a better idea on how the spatial component or how the spatial positioning works in SkyDust. And I'm going to solo oscillator 6. So let's go back into our instrument and let's, uh, this was essentially once again this, this instrument that we had and let's solo oscillator 6 and what we are left with is this plucky sound and this plucky sound is sort of oscillating here on the left side of my sound field. And uh, let's check out how we can actually move that around. Now, in order to do that, let's go into the spatial uh, page and let's maybe also select the spatial view here so that we have a better understanding of how that sound moves around. Now, at the moment, and we... Um, essentially talking about oscillator 6, so I need to select oscillator 6. I see that uh, what I have active here is the LFO, the low frequency oscillator, and this low frequency oscillator essentially makes sure that the sound is moving around. Now it does have a certain start position. The start position can be set here. So if I move that, for example, into a different space, uh, it's going to start somewhere else. So let's kind of maybe put that back where it was. Um, I can also uh, randomize that a little. So there's this little slider here below that uh, positioning page, or be below this positioning graph. I can essentially kind of create a little area. And this area essentially means that the, um, that the sound is going to be positioned. Whenever I play, that sound is going to be positioned it, somewhere in that area, but it's never going to be the same. So if I I'm, if I'm play that sound multiple times, you will actually see that uh, popping up in different places. 
and it's always going to be oscillating here. So let's let's maybe kind of move that back and kind of kind of set that back to zero. Um, uh, we can obviously kind of change the rate. We can change delay. Now here is the the, uh, the depth, and that essentially means how far uh, or how much uh, spatial influence that oscillator actually has. So if I if I'm increasing the azimuth, that essentially means that I have a broader uh, a broader angle of kind of um, oscillating here. So if if I'm if I'm playing that sound again, right, and if I'm if I'm changing the azimuth uh, and increasing that, what it will essentially happen is it will kind of oscillate over a wider area. I can do the same thing with the elevation. That essentially means that it's also going to oscillate in the direction of the uh, of the elevation. And in in our particular example, this essentially means that it's going to kind of move upwards. So it's going to oscillate in that direction. And I can also do the same thing in distance. So let me just set that back maybe. And this was somewhere at 80. So let's go back here. We can obviously also do all kinds of uh, modification. So, for example, we can do. Uh, I like the wave folding thing going on. So let's just fold that here a little. So, and that will, will essentially kind of move that in in a sort of a kind of a folded way. So that's actually fairly unique. Now, instead of using an LFO, you can also use an envelope generator, and that's actually one of the most unique things of this particular synth. And that is that it it is capable of using an envelope generator for positional information and. That is actually unique. So let's let's have a look on how that how that actually works. So um, let's uh, activate the envelope generator on that particular oscillator. So once again, we are working with oscillator six here, and we do have attack decay, sustain, and release. And uh, during those times of attack decay, this sustain and release, we can control the positional change of that particular object. So um, let me, in order to make that a little bit clearer, let me maybe disable the LFO because the LFO will essentially kind of uh, be dominant in that particular setup. So let's just disable that for the moment. And uh, so what I can do is, so let me first of all kind of change the release time a little. So, so kind of add a little bit of a release and uh, maybe also a little bit of kind of an attack time and a decay time. And what I can do is I can change the position information uh, or the position of those sound objects during those time periods. So during the attack time, during the decay time, during the sustain time, during the release time. So let's maybe kind of do something like this. Um, and you will see two curves here. And the reason for that is because there's an azimuth curve and an elevation curve. So we are once again in the three-dimensional space. So, so um, thinking of this as something that's happening on the sphere. So with two parameters, azimuth and elevation and uh, and let's uh, do the sustain maybe kind of I don't know let's do something here well that kind of looks extreme let's do it like that and then the release uh, let's do something in the back and that will essentially kind of change the way the sound kind of moves so let's just see and uh, it's probably better to kind of uh, open up the spatial uh, view here so essentially, I see how that sound essentially kind of works. So the this is during the sustain. If I now release, I have that movement during the release time. And that allows me to move that sound around quite a bit. Now, if you feel uncomfortable controlling it, because that takes, quite frankly, a little bit getting used to, um, it is unusual, uh, but uh, kind of in a, in, a, in a very good way unusual, but it takes a little bit of practice in order to get that right. But if you want, you can also use so-called movement modifiers. So instead of working with the um, with the ADSR, what you can do is you can uh, change the position of the sound with simple modifiers, and, and that is kind of separated or that is divided into a start part. That's sort of where the object starts out. A move part that that is sort of happening during the uh, up to the sustain and then the release where kind of you have the final movement during the release time and I can choose what I want. There are certain kind of presets that I can use. So for example, I can say during the move time, I want this um, kind of to be a random rotation and I can choose uh, the uh, certain certain parameters here and at the release time, I want maybe kind of uh, move that into a final position. Let's kind of move that maybe into that direction and let's see how that how that works. So, so it's it's sort of moving, and then I say if I'm releasing, it's kind of moving back.
And I can, in the very same way, I can uh, also change the positional information in such a way that I have some randomization. So if I'm increasing the slider here, that essentially means that the starting position is going to be somewhere here in this area. And I can also do the same thing for the, for the final position. And that gives me a little bit more flexibility. So it's going to start out in different locations and it's going to end up in different locations. And you can also uh, have the release uh, movement. So, so for example, you want uh, during the release time you want maybe a kind of a rotation, and you can tell it how much. And then essentially the the first part is sort of during the sustain, and then once I release the key, it's going to rotate. And that's actually fairly neat. Now I can control the spatial information for each oscillator individually, or I can also control it globally. And that kind of gives you a lot of flexibility on how you can move your sound particles around and how you can actually kind of control the spatial nature of your sound. Now let's try another example. Now what I've done here is I've loaded up a MIDI clip in Ableton. Uh, there's a little bit of a piano thing that's going on here. And uh, let's choose a different preset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select one from the keys presets and uh, maybe the mid keys here. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the one here. So as you see, there's a lot of movement going on here. But that movement is really limited to the horizontal plane. So we're going to kind of change that a little um, as we go along. Now let's just have a brief listen on how that uh, MIDI clip sounds with that. That's already pretty nice. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a couple of adjustments to that particular preset. And the first thing that I'm noticing is that because I want to have a little bit more of a plucky sound, uh, let me just go back into the oscillator section. And uh, let's let's see, um, one of the oscillators is uh, responsible for that plucky thingy going on here. And uh, that I think is oscillator three. Let me just solo that. Yeah. So what I can do is I can maybe kind of uh, put that or kind of move that up an octave. And I think that will sound better. So let's let's try that again. Let's try that maybe. Yeah, I like that better. Okay. So let's go into the spatial page and change the position a little bit. So um, let's open that up. And uh, for this particular sound, the um, spatial position is actually kind of mon mon managed or kind of is modified through a global uh, low frequency oscillator and that is sort of a noise oscillator. So that sort of, you can see how that moves. And what I, what I want to do is maybe I want to sync that up to our sound and maybe maybe do an eighth. So let, let me just uh, listen to how that sounds. Let's just open up the spatial view here so that we have a better understanding. Now, obviously, what we can do is we can change the elevation in order to create a little bit more of a three-dimensional image here. That will essentially kind of move the, the sound in, uh, or kind of have it oscillate in, in kind of a more of a three-dimensional way. But let's just set that back. Uh, one thing that I can also do is I can change the, the where the, the, the starting point uh, is of the, of the individual object. So if I'm kind of increasing that, you can see that it's kind of really moving around now. I can maybe add a envelope generator. And I can maybe kind of change the individual positions of the attack. Maybe with a little bit of randomness. Maybe a longer attack time. Do the same thing at the release. As you can see, I get, I get a lot of action here. So change to the key time maybe. And let's move the sustain somewhere. Yeah, I think that's fine. 
Uh, one of the nice things is that this synthesizer also allows you to save everything as presets. So you have presets for oscillators, presets for filters, presets for frequency modulation, for pitch modulation, for uh, arpeggiator kind of settings and spatial settings. Um, and you can call them individually or you can call them in uh, at once. Now there's one final thing that I should probably mention and that is that this uh, the output of that uh, synth can uh, not only be in stereo, it can also be binaural. So if you want to hear the this uh, how this sounds in binaural, all you really have to do is you have to change the output to binaural. And the nice thing about this is that you can actually change uh, the um, head related transfer function. So you can go into the settings and you can uh, use your own uh, head-related transfer function and load that in and kind of thereby really personalize your experience. So that's the stereo part of Skydust. Um, if you're working with a digital audio workstation that is stereo only, then this is pretty much everything that you need. But if you're working with something like Cubase or Pro Tools or any other digital audio workstation that is capable of handling multi-channel audio, one thing that's really unique here is that you can actually set it up as a multi-channel instrument. And once again, it can even be an ambisonics instrument up to sixth order ambisonics really. And uh, so the last couple of minutes, what I would like to do is I would like to simply show you how to set that up in Cubase because in Cubase things are a little bit different and there are a couple of things that you need to do in order to get that going. Now here I have an empty session of Cubase and all I really want to do now is I want to add a, an instance of Skydust in such a way that it produces ambisonics directly so that it is actually used as an ambisonics synth. Now in order to make this work, uh, there's one thing that you need to do in Cubase and Noendos by the way is exactly the same thing. You need to go into the studio settings and under audio connections, what we need to do is we need to uh, add an output um, that is uh, that essentially matches what we want to produce in. So if you want to produce something in ambisonics, we need to add an ambisonics output because only if you have that output, the um, we will be actually able to create an instrument that, that kind of has these types of channel configurations. So what we need to do is we need to simply add a bus. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a third order ambisonics bus. I've already done that once, so this is why it's selected here. And let's call that ambisonics. And add that bus. Now, uh, it doesn't really, it, depending on how you work with that, you might need to set this to be the main mix, but the way we are going to use it, this is actually not, necess not really necessary because in the end, I'm actually going to route that back into the stereo output because I only have a stereo system here. Now, um, I usually say that I don't like to use the control room, but if I want to use Skydust that way, I actually have to work with the control room. So what I have is in the control room, I have my interface uh, connected. So let's add an instance of Skydust and... Uh, in order to do that, all we really need to do is we need to add an instrument track. And um, I'm going to use Skydust. The audio output that I'm going to use is Ambisonics. Once again, this is the third order Ambisonics output that I just created. Let's call that Skydust and uh, Dust. And let's add that track. Now, if I'm now selecting the output to be the, um, so let me just kind of Click here, if I'm selecting that to be a third order ambisonics, it will actually come back with an error saying that there is additional configuration that I need to do. And that is because even though I already have that output generated, I have not yet activated that output in the instrument itself. Uh, in order to do that, I need to go into the inspector. And in the inspector, there's this little button here uh, that says activate outputs. That's next to the to the instrument uh, that, that, that is selected in the inspector. So let's click on that. And uh, essentially here I can now select which outputs I want to activate. And I actually want to have a third order ambisonics output. So let's activate that. Now as soon as I activate, you will see that there is an additional track that has been generated and that is the ambisonics output. That is the output from the Skydust instrument. And if I'm now changing Skydust to uh, be third order ambisonics, it will actually now work and I will hear everything with uh, with a Skydust that is producing sound in Ambisonics. Now currently everything is routed into the stereo output. Uh, now in order to better see what's happening here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to in the um, channel panel of the output from the Skydust instrument, I'm going to change that from the MB decoder into the uh, Audio Brewers decoder. If you've been following my videos, you know that I'm a big fan of Audio Brewers. They have very, very 
uh, amazing plugins. And one of the things that I really like to use is their decoder. And the reason I like to use it is simply because you can see, uh, you, you can actually really see what's going on here. So if I'm playing that sound now, you actually see the individual kind of uh, ambisonics channels, how they come into the decoder and how they are decoded. Now, because the signal is now sent into an ambisonics track, I can actually use ambisonics effects uh, in order to get even more creative. And one thing I can do, for example, I can use the stutter effect that I used in one of the previous videos in order to kind of get a little bit of stuttering going on on top of everything that Skydust is already doing. So let's do that. Um, so what I'm going to do for that is I'm simply going to go into this output track. Once again, this is this track that uh, has been generated in order to hold the ambisonics output of Skydust. Um, so let me just open that up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the stutter effect. This once again is the stutter effect from Audio Brewers. If you have not seen my video about that effect, um, please watch it. I think it's really interesting and it's a very, very creative effect. I, I really like what, what all the Audio Brewers are doing with that. Uh, now, for this uh, video, I'm just going to use it as a demonstration here, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, in order to get a better understanding, I'm going to simply turn off the dry signal and I'm going to uh, reduce the buffer size. Once again, if you want to know why I'm doing that, watch that video that I produced last week. And then let's also open up Skydust itself in order to have all three uh, things simultaneously on the screen here. Just kind of arrange it a little. And uh, so essentially what's happening now is that Skydust is producing the audio in a three-dimensional way. It's producing it directly in ambisonics, which once again is very unique. I'm not sure if there are any other synths out there that can produce ambisonics directly. And then we have that uh, we're sending that into the stutter effect as an ambisonic signal where we are going to stutter some of the um, higher ambisonics uh, um, kind of channels, and then uh, it is decoded through the audio brewer's um, decoder into a stereo signal. So let's uh, let's just play a note here, and I can I can essentially also change the the speed here, and I can play there. can do all kinds of things with it. And I think that is really, really cool. So what's my final verdict? Now, it is very rare that a company comes up with a completely new concept for a synthesizer. And this is actually one of those instances, those rare instances. Um, Skydust does things that no other synthesizer does. Now, if you are a sound designer working on movie productions, working on game design, uh, audio di for games, um, then this, uh, in my personal opinion, comes as a godsend. This is, uh, in my opinion, really a must-have uh, if you are a sound designer because it allows you to do things in ways that you couldn't do before or where you at least needed different types of plugins that were working in tandem. Here you have one synthesizer that essentially is capable of doing everything in one piece and that that is really, really neat. Whether or not this is something that a regular bedroom producer will use will depend quite a lot on the quality of presets that are going to ship with the um, with the synth. Um, I, I'm told that uh, they have commissioned a professional um, patch designers to create patches for Skydust and I'm really looking forward to hearing them. Probably going to do a second video in a week or two where I'm going to look at those presets because the success of that plugin I think really depends on the quality of presets. It is fairly complex to work with. Uh, you need to really be able to think about sound in a three-dimensional way so it has a bit of a learning curve and uh, if you don't have the presets that go along with it then um, people might not be willing to really spend the time with this and to to use it but once again if you're a sound designer i think this is a must-have you really <laughs> this is something you really need in my personal opinion so this is really everything I wanted to say today. Thanks again for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please use the comment section below or join my Discord community. Invite link is in the description below. And with that being said, see you at the next video.